I can write this thing is Q D cross E because Q is a scalar thing I can move it now I have defined the dipole moment is equal to Q D so I can write this is the dipole moment into this one so the M the total torque will be equal to the cross product of the dipole moment and E. Now in which direction this torque will be? From the basic definition of the cross product you can understand this thing. Yes. Torque the rotation. It will be perpendicular to P. It will be perpendicular to E. e. And it will be perpendicular to the plane of both of these. So we will have our torque equal to this, but our job is not yet done. We will have to write this thing. What will be the net force? The net force will be equal to F, which will be the sum of F plus and F minus. And I can write that this will be Q E plus and Q E minus. So I can write it as Q delta E. The force will be equal to Q times delta E. It is the difference between plus and minus. E plus minus E minus. And now there is a very uh, basic definition and that I can write. That if I want to write change M E like the x component of this then I can write this one or I can say define this gradient of E x dot E now this is E x a component and this D is it right? what is gradient? this is D by D x here it is D so for one component, I can write E x, so dimensionally this one is right, it will be only in that direction, it will pick the component from D which will be along this one, the perpendicular will become 0. So I can write this in the divergence form, the, sorry the gradient form and this one, okay, look here. How I can write this one? D E by D X and then it is here if I write with D X then there is no problem yeah. with this one. Right? Because these two are cancelling and again you are having D E. This is big change. Delta, this is big delta, big change. This one, when I write small g, this is small change. And now, what is this dx? dx is that small change which is in the direction of x. Right? So, if I put a dot product between it, this one, you know the like component gives you the result while the unlike component like y and z will give you 0. So, this one, this dx, then I can write is total d. R I can write as total R, no problem with it because R is X and I, Y and G and Z and K. So when I write dot here, then it will only pick its own component. So this is the way to write this thing, means the change you can write in the form of a derivative as well. Gradient here is a directional derivative. Now we can say that more compactly in vector form this I can write is del E is equal to the gradient of E okay now one thing we should uh, be careful here that this one 
I will have to change a little bit. This is gradient of a scalar. Now I want to write this E as a vector. Then I cannot write gradient of a vector. Okay? But I know one thing. The dot product is commutative. So I can write this one earlier and this one later. So let's write this one D dot and gradient of EX. Can I write like this? Now this one, if I want to write is D dot del and I write, what will be the result of this? The result of this will be a scalar. So I can write the vector direction will be obtained by writing this as a vector. Clear? So now these two will give me a scalar quantity and then it will be operated on a vector E. From here it will get the direction E. So it is just reshuffling or making the proper shape of the equation. So then I can write that if I multiply this one with Q, then Q delta E is equal to Q D dot del and Q D dot del E. Can I write like this? And this one is the force because this is F. This one is P dot del and E. So I have written force which was just F equal to QE in the form of dipole moment and the electric field. Clear? You can check the dimensions it's coming out of force. Because here P is QD, Q times D. Here this one is one word, D. Cancel, Q times E is force. So this was all for, you can say, the force which is uh, experienced by a dipole. Now one thing. If the force or the field will be uniform, it will only cause bending, right? It will only cause torque. But if the field will become non-uniform, it will not only cause the bending but will also the force. Non-uniform electric field will cause force as well. Torque plus force. That will be the non-uniform electric field issue. But at the moment, we will keep ourselves to uniform electric field. The non-uniform electric field we will deal with uh, when we will go to the electrodynamics portion. Over there, we will cover the non-uniform fields as well. Field is changing, whether it's electric field or magnetic field, whether it's changing with time or it's changing in space, that we will cover in electrodynamics. Okay, so let me define what is polarization. If I define capital P, capital P is defined or its vector quantity as well. If I say this is the dipole moment per unit volume, the dipole moment per unit volume. So if I will multiply with this P, capital P, the volume, D tau, then it will give me the dipole moment. So small p is the dipole moment 
while capital P is the dipole moment per unit volume. Capital U, P you can call the dipole moment in terms of dipole density because it is per unit volume. So this is a way to represent this one but before understanding the field of a polarized object we will have to study uh, some bound charges and free charges. I think this derivation which is over here in uh, Griffiths I will not go to this derivation because we will do all this derivation when we will cover with the BS, the basic electrodynamics. I will just write the surface charge and the volume charge. So the surface charge is written is from the bound charges is sigma B and this is equal to capital P dot M, M a unit vector and this one is actually defined as and rho B when we define this minus divergence of P. You can get this thing from the equation from the potential equation you can get this expression very easily after a few step derivation and you know that when you will put a material inside electric field then if it's a solid material it is having some inner volume and it is having some surface so the charges which will come on the surface are the bound surface charge and the charges which will be inside the volume are actually the volume bound charge. This is dielectric, so all the charges are bound. Clear? There are no free charges here. So we will go to our aim, and the aim is to derive the maximum equations in inside a dielectric, inside a material. <coughs> now what will happen, what will happen to Gauss's law when we will place a dielectric inside an electric field. So the shape of Gauss's law will change and we will now see that why this thing will change. We know that all materials are composed of bound charges and free charges. In the Gauss's law, we have written just rho. And rho is actually the volume charge density. Now this rho, if we differentiate, so it will be in some portion will be the bound charge, some portion will be the free charge. We actually to apply this thing in a dielectric, we want to categorize it. We want to separately deal the bound and the free charges. So we say that rho will be equal. So this is under the electric displacement the electric displacement which we denote by D e, we will derive it then what it is rho is the sum of rho bound and rho free some bound charges and some free charges now I can write that rho the equation of uh, Gauss's law we can write is epsilon naught times divergence of E is equal to rho and this rho is equal to rho B plus rho F and the rho B equation we can get from here. So epsilon naught divergence of E is equal to rho 
B is minus divergence of P and plus rho F. And if I move this one here, then I can write the divergence of epsilon naught E plus P is equal to rho F. And this thing I define is the electric displacement D. So electric displacement D is the divergence of D is equal to rho F. Now look here. That over there it was the electric field which was diverging. And that was equal to the total charge there. In the total charge it was bound as well as free. Here D is only dealing the free charges. So what is D? We will now see this thing. That 